Well, we spent much of the last 10 days in Israel. Dean Lynn and I had the privilege of touring the Holy Land with a group of about 500 people, about 200 of whom were Oak Hills members, and what a trip it was. We studied the Bible in some of Israel's oldest amphitheaters. We celebrated Sunday worship on the Sea of Galilee. About 250 members of our group chose to celebrate their salvation by being baptized in the Jordan River. The week was made even more special because of the time of the year that we're all in, just a week from Easter. This is a special time of the year. And I thought it would be wise for us to focus on our Palm Sunday message on some of the particular moments that Jesus experienced during the final week of his life. Specifically, two tables in two different locations. One in Bethany and one in the upper room, one on Saturday night and one on Thursday night. One at which Jesus was served, the other at which Jesus served. Both tables serve to help us understand some of the majesty and the beauty of the final week of Christ. Let's pray together, and we'll get to work. Have mercy upon us, Lord. Collect our thoughts. Open our hearts. Forgive the sins of our speaker. Please grant that we could see Christ and just Christ. Through him we pray, and all the church said. I'm reading from Matthew chapter 26 and verse 6. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil. And she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, why do you trouble this woman? For she has done a good work for me, for you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. So a circle of friends surround Jesus. They are at the table, and the table is in Bethany at the house of Simon. Simon the leper, at least he was a leper until Jesus touched him. But once Jesus touched him, he was healed. And now on the week that we call the final week of Christ, On the eve of Palm Sunday, Simon has Jesus and Jesus' followers over for dinner. Simple act, but it must have meant a lot to Jesus. He knows what the week holds. After all, the Pharisees are already clearing him a cell on death row. Won't be long until they begin to finger the followers of Jesus as accomplices. Could be that by the end of the week, all of the disciples will have their faces appear on wanted posters. It's a risky thing to have a wanted man in your house. It takes more nerve, however, to place your hand on the sore of a leper, and that's what Jesus did for Simon. And now Simon wants to send a message to Jesus, and that is, if you ever need a place to be, my home is yours. And he invited Jesus into his house. By the end of the week, Jesus will be in several different homes. None will give him this kind of hospitality. He will visit the house of the high priest, 
quite likely the nicest house in Jerusalem. Three barns in the back, a beautiful view of the valley, but Jesus won't see the view. He'll see only the false witnesses and hear the lies and feel the sting of the slaps. Before the end of the week, Jesus will actually visit the chambers of Herod, the elegant chambers, plenty of servants. Maybe there's fruit and wine on the table, but Herod won't offer anything to Jesus. He wants Jesus to do a trick. Come on, country boy, show me a miracle, he'll say. Before the week is up, Jesus will also visit the home of Pilus, Pilate, the procurator of Israel. Should be a great honor to stand before the couch of Pilate, a time that he would always remember. As it turns out, it's a time that Pilate, well, he had God in his presence, and he could have performed the greatest act of mercy in history, but he missed his opportunity. Pilate didn't see Jesus for who Jesus was, but Simon did. Simon did. And because Simon saw Jesus as someone special, he gave Jesus a meal, an invitation to his house. It may not seem like much, but he gave more than anyone else. And when the priests and the elders accused Jesus, maybe Jesus remembered that meal at Simon's house and the memory gave him some comfort. No doubt Jesus remembered the act of Mary and received comfort as well. It was 12 ounces worth of perfume, 12 ounces, concentrated, sweet, strong enough to scent a man's clothes and skin for days. Maybe she was the only one who believed Jesus when Jesus was forecasting his own death. Maybe she was the only one who believed that when Jesus spoke, you ought to listen because, you see, it was Jesus who spoke when her brother Lazarus was in a tomb. He had been in that tomb for four days, and when Jesus spoke, the dead man walked out. So when Mary heard Jesus say that his own death was imminent, she believed him, and she anointed him for burial. This wasn't an act of impulse. She carried the vial of perfume from her house to Simon's. It wasn't a spontaneous gesture, but it certainly was an extravagant one. The perfume was worth a year's wages. A year's wages. Maybe it's the only thing of value she had. It wasn't a logical thing to do, but since when is love driven by logic? It wasn't logic that healed Simon. It wasn't logic that raised Lazarus from the dead. It wasn't logic that kept forgiving the disciples. It was love. And it fell to Mary on the Saturday night before the final week of Christ to extend to Jesus this unforgettable, unmistakable, yet controversial act of of love. She steps up behind him and she stands with the jar in her hand. Within a couple of moments, every mouth in the room is silent and every eye is wide as they watch her nervous fingers remove the ornate cover. Only Jesus is unaware of her presence. She stands behind him with her jar of perfume and she pours it out over his head. It soaks his hair, it rolls down on his shoulders, it rolls down his back, it's absorbed into his skin and clothing. Any smell of herbs and lambs is quickly eclipsed by the rush of the fragrance of this perfume. Wherever you go, this gesture declares. Wherever you go, breathe this aroma and remember one who cares. How many of you think that sometime during the final week of Christ he could breathe that aroma? He only owned one tunic, so he sure didn't go and change. So the rest of the week, everywhere he went, there was this fragrance from this act of love. 
when he rode on the donkey the next day, when he stood against the hypocrites in the temple on Monday, when he made declarations about the upcoming days on Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday in the upper room, Friday, in between the lashes of the Roman whip as he's carrying his cross, even as the nails are being pounded, did the scent, the fragrance of that act of love lift his spirits just a bit. And when they took his tunic and they tore it, and then they gambled for it, did the scent of that moment bring hope and encouragement to Christ? I like to think it did. I know that Jesus defended her act of generosity when the disciples criticized her They said it could have been sold for a great deal of money and given to the poor, but Jesus was quick to defend her extravagance. Why are you troubling this woman? She did an excellent thing for me. You know, there's a place for extravagant gestures of love. There is a time to demonstrate love to Christ by loving someone else. I think Simon and Mary work together to help us step into our own Holy Week in a better way. Open your house this week to Christ. Just invite Him to the table. Even before you put your head on the pillow tonight, take some time and say, Lord, this week, Come into my house. Sit at my table, please. Speak into my world. Wherever I go, you go. Dedicate some time to making sure that Jesus knows as he looks across this planet, he can find one person in you with whom he can share as much time as needed. What about Mary? Perhaps you could imitate her extravagant gesture. What would be an extravagant gesture from you that would bring honor to Christ? What's something you could do this week that would cause a sweet-smelling aroma, a cloud of love to float into the presence of the King of Kings? Something extravagant, not something predictable, Not something required, but maybe something like forgiving that person who's hard to forgive just because Jesus said so. Writing a letter of kindness to someone who doesn't deserve kindness because Christ has first been kind to you. Giving a gift to someone who needs a gift. Caring for someone who is poor helping someone who is sick, treating the body of Christ. Boy, not one of us reads the story of Mary and the story of Simon without thinking, oh, I would have liked to have been the one who opened my house, who poured out my perfume for Christ. I would have liked to have been. You can. You see, stories like this are in the Bible, again, not to show us just what they did, but to show us what we do to make Holy Week special. Continuing in Matthew chapter 26, this time in verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to him, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. There may have been other tables at which Christ sat, but we know that there was this second one on Thursday night. The table in the upper room. It's a familiar passage. So I'm going to come at it from an unfamiliar angle. Put your imagination hat on, will you please? And let's 
let's imagine that something really crazy happened to you. Let's imagine, let's suppose that you were invited to a dinner with the president, not because you are a famous statesman. In fact, if you can just bear with me, let's imagine that you have a simple profession. You're a dishwasher at the restaurant, and you're at the restaurant washing dishes when one night there's a knock on the kitchen door. You look around, and nobody's there to answer the door, so you dry off your hands on the apron, and you walk over, and you open the door, and there is a courier, a very official-looking man in a dark suit carrying a briefcase, and he steps in, and he says, I'm from the White House, and I came to deliver this letter to you. Well, part of you wonders if you're in trouble. Another part of you wonders if this isn't a joke from your cousin Alfred trying to settle the score because you put the horseradish in his car. And all of you thinks this guy's got the wrong guy. But you take the letter and you realize it's a personal letter. Your name is on the front, not typed, but written in cursive. The stationery is the heavy, expensive type which blows the cousin Alfred theory. He would never spring for something like this. Couldn't be a bill. Collectors aren't this formal. So you open the letter and, well, how do you do? It's a personal handwritten letter from the president. You look up at the fellow who brought the note and he's smiling like this is the part of the job he likes the best. And you look at the note, it's an invitation to a dinner, a dinner given in your honor, a dinner dedicated to you. Oh, what's the catch? You ask the guy. There's no catch, he says. But I just need to know if you accept or not. You still can't believe it, but you don't know what else to say except Yes, he gives you the date, and on that date, you put on your best clothing, and you go to Pennsylvania Avenue, where sure enough, they're waiting on you. More people in dark official suits. They escort you into the White House. They turn you over to the chief of staff, who walks you down a hallway that is lined with portraits of prior presidents, and at the end of the corridor is a banquet room and in the center of the room is a long table and in the center of the table is just one plate and next to that one plate is one name plate and on that name plate there is one name guess whose name the attendant motions for you to sit down and when you do he leaves and finally you're able to say what you've been wanting to say and that is wow You've never seen a place like this. You've never seen a table this long. You've never seen crystal this nice. You've never seen china this valuable. You've never seen a setting with this many forks or a candelabra with this many candles. <laughs> and you've sure never seen what you see next. Straight ahead of you is a hearth and a white mantle. And above the mantle is a painting, a painting of you. Yes, you with your goofy smile and Nose you wish was half its size. That's you. You in the painting. I keep it here so I can think of you often. You don't have to turn around to see who said that. You recognize the voice of the president. And you wait to turn around until his hand is on your shoulder and you look up and he is wearing a smile on his face and an apron on his waist. The president is wearing an apron, a common apron just like the one you wear when you work, and if that isn't enough, behind him there is a dinner cart. He reaches for your bread plate and gives you a dinner roll, and he says, I'm so glad you could come and let me serve you. You thought it was shocking to get the invitation. You thought it was breathtaking to see the White House. Your jaw hit the floor when you saw your picture on the wall. But nothing compares to this. The commander-in-chief as a waiter, this isn't how it's supposed to work. You're telling, I should be serving you. You're the 
top dog. <laughs> I should be serving you. He says, no, no. Today I serve you. Now, I told you it was a crazy story. Do things like that ever happen? They do for those who see it. For those aware of it, this happens every week. In banquet halls around the world where the commander honors the common, here we are, regular folk, right out of the kitchen in the carpools of life, and we've been invited to the commander's table. And he breaks the bread, and he says, this is my body. And he pours the wine, and he says, this is my blood. We call it the Lord's Supper. Maybe you thought it was just a ritual. Maybe you thought it was simply an observance. Maybe you thought it was a memorial to something that happened back then or a reenactment of a meal he had with them. If so, oh, there is so much more. It is a meal he has with you. It's easy to miss the significance of the Lord's Supper. When I was a young boy, I served on a church corps of kids or young men who took communion to people in our small West Texas town. You see, there were people who were shut in who couldn't get out. And this was long before we watched church services online. And people would want someone from the church to come, read a scripture, even bring the communion elements. Our pastor was overworked, and so he recruited a handful of us to take on this responsibility. So every Sunday afternoon and evening, we would drive around and make five or six stops. One stop would always include the hospital, anyone who happened to be hospitalized who couldn't get out. I remember one time in particular, there were three of us young men. I'm thinking I was maybe eight or nine or ten years of age, somewhere in that range. And the other guys were as well, maybe a bit older. And the trio of us went into a hospital room where there was a man in a hospital bed, an elderly man so weak we could not wake him up. We talked to him. He didn't stir. We shook him. He didn't wake up. We didn't know what to do. I mean, how? What were we to say if we went back and the preacher said, Did you? And we said, No. He was, We thought, We've got to do our job. One of the fellows noticed that though the man was asleep, his mouth was open. So we did. <laughs> Prayed for the bread, and I placed it on his tongue. Prayed for the cup, poured it down his throat. The guy never woke up. Some people don't wake up still. Just kind of sleep through it. In this special, significant moment, inaugurated during the final week, the Palm Sunday week of Christ, it comes and goes. I don't think I understand it all. I'll just tell you. I don't think we're supposed to understand it all. But I know this. It's a sacrament, not a sacrifice. The sacrifice is something we do for Christ. The sacrament is a gift God gives to us. And somehow he intertwines himself in the mystery of this moment and says, this is my body, and this is my blood. And of all the things that Jesus could have chosen to do on the night before his crucifixion, he chose to establish this very simple meal to add new understanding to the Passover and hand it down from generation to generation, from century to century, to common people like us, to receive communion. That's the verb. 
receive communion. Because the big point of Matthew's gospel is Jesus is the one who puts on the apron. Jesus is the one who takes the initiative. Jesus is the one who invites you to his upper room. Jesus is the one who selected the place, who prepared the meal on that final week, in that final Passover. It was Jesus who did the serving. It was his disciples who were served. Did you notice in Matthew 26, Jesus took, Jesus blessed, Jesus broke, Jesus gave. At the supper, Jesus is not the served, but Jesus is the servant. He's the active one at the table. He's not portrayed as one who reclines and says, come and serve me. He is one who urges us to be still and let him serve us. The Lord's Supper, my friend, is a gift to you. This is the Lord's table at which we sit. This is the Lord's invitation that we receive. And though it, it might be a man or a woman who distributes the bread and the cup your way, truly it's Jesus who's walking among us, issuing the invitation, the holy invitation. And when the bread is broken, Christ breaks it. When the wine is poured, Christ pours it. And when your burdens are lifted, it's because the king in the apron has drawn near. Think about that as you accept the invitation. We usually find it much easier to be doers than receivers. But at the core of the Christian faith is the ability to be still and receive. To be still and let God do what we cannot. In this moment, would you let Jesus love you? Would you open this invitation from Him? And would you let Him do what only He can do? Minister to the deepest parts of your soul. By the way, this is not the last time that Jesus will do something like this. What happens on earth is just a warm-up for what will happen on, in heaven. Jesus said that the Master Himself will dress and serve and tell the servants to sit at the table in heaven and he will serve them. At that supper, we'll see him with eyes. Now we see him with, play, with faith. But may you see him as he comes and serves you. And so, Heavenly Father, we pause now to receive. Just to receive to let you do your supernatural work, to conduct miracles of healing and hope stirring in our own selves. We get so busy, we run so hard, we have so many things on our to-do list. It's so good, Lord, to have something on our done list. And that